Welcome back, friends. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com. November 2017 subscriber-only video. Thank you for waiting. I know I usually say I put these in the first newsletter of the month. It hasn't been that way for a while, so thank you for uh, being patient. But boy, do I have a treat for you. You will, of course, remember the man that we're talking to today, Vinny Caggiano, a.k.a. Vin Cognito, up on YouTube, because he was in my Summer Music 2017 playlist video that I did earlier. And uh, also that I was in a three-way conversation with him and Ricky Verandas of The Ripple Effect talking about music and conspiracy and all of that good stuff. So uh, let's welcome him back. Vinny Caggiano, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm excited. Uh, you asked for a specific song for me to analyze <laughs> by the Beatles, of course. Yes, I and, did. And uh, I'm very excited about this. particular. You chose the right song because this one comes up for a few reasons when I'm teaching. I and, am, uh, I'm waiting with bated breath to hear about that because, let me set the background for people, for people who haven't seen those previous conversations or the, the previous videos I talked about there, Vinny Caggiano is a guitar god who has played in a bajillion bands and does lessons and all of this, and several years ago he was doing lessons with a man who was basically wanting him to do a musical analysis of each and every Beatles song, and as far as I understand, you did accomplish that. You did every single Beatles song? Yeah, unfortunately, we lost a few videos along the way, but yeah, we did every song. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of them are up on YouTube. A lot of them, unfortunately, pulled by, because the uh, the people at Apple Corp apparently don't like people uh, playing yeah. three and a half seconds of their music uh, while yeah. teaching a lesson, which is a problem in and of itself. But anyway, that being what it is, as I say, I played a bit of Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite on my uh, uh, summer music uh, playlist video, but uh, there are many, many more really fascinating breakdowns of the musicality of the Beatles' music. And uh, again, this is someone with deep musical knowledge who treats pop songwriters, quote-unquote, as real legitimate songwriters who really were doing extremely important things that were uh, combining new ideas and putting them out in a way that was uh, truly mind-bending. And as you will know if you listen to those previous conversations, yes, I am a Beatles geek. And... I have gone through, uh, the last year and a half, I've gone through another era of Beatle maniacism, <laughs> to make up a word, um, where I've been listening to them constantly and discovering new things and rediscovering old things. One of which was I went through a period of a couple months where I could not stop listening to If I Fell, just an incredible song. And one of those songs you listen to a thousand times before you really start to appreciate how beautiful a song that is. So, of course, I asked Vinny to do an analysis of that. I twisted his arm a little, and he did put one up on his channel just a month or two ago. So I'll, I'll put the link into that if you haven't seen it yet. A uh, great breakdown of why, musically, that is such an interesting song. But the other Especially one... Especially the introduction, yeah. Especially yeah, the, the introduction, introduction and then the modulation, um, mm -hmm. as, you, as you broke down in that video. Very interesting. But... Um, let's get into this other, uh, just about a month or two ago, I was obsessed with this song, which is another song I've listened to a thousand times before I realize just how great it is, and it works on every level. We're talking about You Won't See Me, which of course was from the Rubber Soul album released in December 1965. This particular track, for those keeping track at home, was recorded on November 11th, 1965 if you're into that sort of thing, and features, of course, the lead vocals uh, and bass guitar of Paul McCartney, who wrote the song, and he was also on piano. Um, John was uh, backing vocals along with George, who was also playing rhythm guitar and tambourine, apparently. Ringo was on drums, and Mal Evans was on the Hammond organ, according to the Beatles' Bible. So, I don't know, Tate, I don't know, I, I don't get into the track-by-track, track, every single recording, who did what analysis, but... That's what it says there. Seems but, you knew that one. <laughs> well, well, I'm looking at thebeatlesbible.com right now, so uh, that's what they're saying. Um, okay, but it is right. an incredible song, and now Vinny is going to tell us why it is such an incredible song. Okay, before we get started, just one quick little thing about um, the Beatles analysis I did on my YouTube channel is that um, the first, the early Beatles stuff, I would do all within an hour, so I quickly ran through a lot of those songs. So if you, James, or any of your fans have any interest in me going back to the, some of those early days, uh, including, I think, Revolver and uh, Rubber Soul, I went through as an album rather than song by song. So, you know, if anybody wants a real in-depth look at one of these, I'd be happy to do it. And uh, if you haven't seen me analyze before, you'll, you'll understand just how detailed I can get. I'm trying to arrange this lamp in a better way. 
All right, so in order to have this discussion, there are two important points of music theory that I have to bring up. All right, and those two important points are something called lines, which I will describe and explain, and the blues turnaround. And as it's strange, a song, a very pop, very pop, kind of happy little number would have some kind of blues influence in it. But I, I'll show you actually that this particular little uh, blues turnaround insinuates itself into so much American music um, from the time of the inception of the blues all the way through all of its pop music. And here it hides inside the chord progression, combines itself with something called lines. And this is an amazing, amazing moment. You know, if McCartney actually knew verbally the way I do, if he knew the music theory, which I'm sure he doesn't, I could have sworn he set out sat down and said, I'm going to write a song that consists of nothing but lines. All right. And when I explain what lines are, you'll get what I'm talking about here because it's everywhere in the song and it's just mind blowing. Now, let me describe what lines are. Okay. First, um, uh, a line could be, uh, you might've heard, uh, say, uh, an old uh, song called Mr. Bojangles, or there's a million songs that do this folk songs, but I'm in the key of C and I'm moving my bass line down, down. So what we have is the actual C scale descending, do, D, La, Sol, Fa, right? And that is what I call, that's a diatonic line, meaning it's following exact scale steps of the key, do, T, La, Sol, Fa. There's another kind of line that's a chromatic line, and what that does is it moves in adjacent half steps. Right? So uh, you might have heard uh, Latin music do... Uh, now, both of those lines are what I call overt. You can hear them very clearly. Or... But if you took a piece of music like um, uh, the Pachelbel Canon, it's a famous, famous piece of music, um, I'll do it in, in the key of C. The chord changes for this are... It's a gorgeous progression. Now... What the listener doesn't know is embedded within that. Now, this is what I call an embedded line. You don't overtly hear this line happening. But in the C chord, the first chord of the piece, I'm transposing to C, by the way, the song is normally in D, but whatever. I'm, uh, so I'm in C, I play, and then for the G chord, I can get the second note of the C scale descending, do, T. Uh, then the line goes back up, but basically we get this far. Uh, the furthest you could take a line diatonically, by the way, is to the second note of the scale, so you get... Then you have to go... It's just the nature of it, but uh, that is, an, is what I call an embedded line. So, da, 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 da. all right, that's embedded. Um, you can also have chromatic embedded lines, which uh, at some point, at some points, you you won't see me as uh, embedded line, but most of them are overt. Um, let me see if I could think of. Oh, then you could have combinations. All right. I did a chromatic line, meaning half steps. Right. And you can have contrary motion lines, which means two lines. One is going in one direction. One is going in another. And a classic example of that, forgive me for bringing this up, is Stairway to Heaven. All right. Where you get. Uh, uh, let me see. Right. So we have one line going, and it actually goes all the way down to that F note. Uh, like that. So 
on the one hand we have the chromatic line going downward and then we have the other line going up and one is chromatic and one is diatonic meaning following scale steps so um, that that's a that's a brilliant little moment right there um, you know it's the problem with that song is it's been beat to death but it's actually a great piece of music it's just been it's become a cliche at this point so it's you know uh, in any case, okay, so that is the idea of lines. Hopefully you get that. Um, that it's basically a, a melody that goes stepwise throughout a chord progression. And it's the chords that actually make that line happen. Um, you know what? Just a quick side note here, just another little example. There's a song in the 60s called Incense and Peppermints. And it was a uber psychedelic song by the Strawberry Alarm Clock. Okay, and they have one moment, and this is like verboten, is to take a minor chord and then move it in parallel. It just sounds so weird to do that, unless you're going for some cinematic effect, but in a pop song it's weird. They get away with it when they go... And the reason why they get away with it, it creates a line that goes... So I have um, a theory about lines um, that they hook the listener without them knowing. On an unconscious level, per people are perceiving a pattern that's not overt necessarily, but it hooks the listener's mind because there is a logic to it. It's stepwise. It's moving stepwise. And uh, so that. Okay. So, uh, all right, getting to You Won't See Me. Now, I used to I used to demonstrate this song in the key of G, and I checked it today, and it's in the key of A, so I have to transpose the whole damn thing. Pretty basic song. Here's the chord changes. A, B7, C, A. A, I'm sorry, A, B7, B, A, A7. And then it repeats A, B, 7, D, A. And just for the benefit of the people watching the video, I should note that we have a little bit of Skype interference, so you were speeding up and going out of sync there oh, for a second. But uh, <laughs> I'm sure you were playing normally, but it's, it sounded a oh, little sped up there. that's too bad, yeah. <laughs> you know what? I've discovered that I absolutely hate technology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you sound bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's a drag, so it's not actually coming across. Oh, it was, uh, like, we can hear you fine. It just sped up just for a second there, and I just wanted to point out it wasn't you <laughs> speeding up the song. <laughs> okay, maybe I should make, you know, James, I could, I could go ahead and do this separately one day and just send you a video, too, if you'd like. I'd be happy to do that. Um, yeah. Think about it. You know, think about right. it. But let's continue on. We'll see how this goes. And um, well, let's do yeah. this for the subscribers, and then maybe you can record a separate version for your channel for later. Yeah, yeah, that's that's perfectly fine. I love doing these anyway. You know that it's it's kind of a. I love them too, as you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so. Uh, now, let's talk about the second aspect of music theory that uh, needs to be covered, um, which is the blues turnaround, which I, I'm sure everybody in the world has heard, which is something like one version of it is... Right? Another one is... They're all quite similar. You can go down... Or you can go up. So maybe that's sounding familiar, right? So yes, that is pervasive throughout the song. And it's hidden in a covert line within the chord movement as well. What, you're ha what you have happening, first of all, this blues turnaround is a line by nature. It's moving down chromatically like that. There, there is one, one diatonic scale step in it, but most of it's chromatic. All right, so um, those are the two elements we're going to look for. Now, when we look at the chord progression A to B7 to D 
to A. We have the blues turnaround going. Well, we have the uh, actually one part without harmony. It's just a. Uh, Right, there you go, right? So against the A chord, I have B, against the da, and those notes are all embedded within each of these chords, okay? Um, this song absolutely blows my mind because the first line, first of all, is going, right? Now, when we go further on down the, the line, first of all, let me take this line. And I'm going to harmonize it in thirds. Right, still a blues turnaround. Right? Well, when we get... So we have the first part that goes... Da, 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 da. Then we have the A7 chord, which brings in this G note. Now we have the harmonized version of the same line going... stays on that one goes down again and then we have which is now the same line going up this is amazing this yeah and you have to think to yourself how could this all have been done innocently without a ton of like manipulation yeah. of the musical material. You're just and... breaking this down sends shivers down my spine. That that <laughs> that amount of information embedded in just these simple chord progressions. Yeah. And this song is all about these two principles interwoven throughout. So again we have da 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 That is mind blowing. It is purely mind blowing. And quite honestly, I was thinking about it tonight, James. I was thinking about this song and what I was going to say about it. And I just don't get it. You know, I went to music school. I had a number of peers who were incredibly intelligent. What if they just pick up on all this material in music school and then forget it when they left? Because I don't understand why people are not commenting on stuff like this. It's blowing my mind. This is pure genius. And it's one particular song. And the other thing that blows my mind about this is. McCartney does it once and then never does it again. It's just it's one little thought experiment. Great, did that, move on. It's like everything the Beatles did. Let's pioneer this entire new area. Entire genres will spring up from it, and we'll just move on next album. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. They were, they were very, very restless, you know. They wanted to compete with their heroes. They wanted to compete with each other, Lennon McCartney. And then they wanted to compete with their own selves, you know. McCartney goes, well, I wrote this, but I got to I got to do better than that. Same with John, you know, unbelievable, unbelievable. All right. So anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm glad I know someone that shares my passion about the Beatles. I really do, because it what they do is truly beautiful. There's no question. It's beautiful. All right. So now we go into the um, the bridge. Um, ta -da, ta -da. that knew what I was missing yeah maybe it just stays on the E um, but we go to B minor D minor this B minor to D minor that's a parallel movement of minor chords which I said parallel movement of minor chords is usually very obtuse sounding uh, I'll give an example like uh, it's great for cinematic music like if I took two minor chords and went like this get that kind of uh, horror movie effect is, is this the guitar sound still kind of all screwy or? no 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 it's it's okay for the most part just a little bit of speeding okay. up here and there but uh all just right. for what it's worth the ultimate guitar tabs is telling me d6 to d minor six uh d6 to d minor six yeah that that'll work that'll work that's fine but you know bear in mind um this is hard to explain. I said B minor. D6 is the same as B minor 7. It's the same exact four notes. I'd have to explain that. Uh, yeah. 
All right. This is this is what's called anharmonica music, where you have two names for one one particular kind of sound. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you used that because that was like a fool on the hill chord. <laughs> All right, so that we could still work with that, though. Um, now we extend the line even further. So far, we did um, right. Now we're going to start our line on the highest note of this D6 chord. Thank you. Uh, guitar. What's the name of that uh, guitar tab? Uh, Ultimate guitar. Com. Ultimate guitar, right, right. All right, so we're starting on this F sharp uh, off the D6 chord. And we hear the line when, when it goes to D minor 6. So we get... Now, as if that wasn't enough, we're on this E note. We're going to go down again. Now, what does the ultimate guitar tab say after the B7 or the B chord? Uh, B7 into E7 sus4 into E7. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah, this is incredible. This is truly incredible. Now, the second chord here, he stays on this, this note of the line for a bit longer. He repeats it. And then for the... So we wind up going... And that is the suspension of the A chord brings us back to that that resolution oh, is just beautiful it's just, just beautiful. beautiful and then and then on top of this just the, the you know the chord progression you have the harmonies going on in the bridge into the verse that mm -hmm. again is just another entire layer of complete beauty that yeah uh, just every level of this works together so beautifully yeah, one thing they found in that song is a pedal point, what's called a pedal point, and that is a note that can um, remain throughout a bunch of chords. So <laughs> I didn't, I forgot to bring this up. Yeah. So not only do we have now we have that pedal point. Now, that must sound familiar. Uh, I think there was a Queen song that did something like the very end of a Queen song. Right, 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 right. Right, right that, but that right there is overt. It's right in your face. Well, let me, let me bring something else into this that's, I think, on point. Again, from the Beatles Bible. This is apparently from Many Years From Now by Barry Miles. This is a quote from Paul about the writing of this song. This was written around two little notes, a very slim phrase, a two-note progression that I had very high on the first two strings of the guitar, the E and the B strings. I had it high up on the E position, and I just let the note on the B string descend a semitone at a time, and kept the top note the same, and against that I was playing a descending chromatic scale. Then I wrote the tune for You Won't See Me Against It. To me, it was very Motown flavored. It's got a James Jamerson feel. He was the Motown bass player. He was fabulous, the guy who did all those great melodic bass lines. It was him, me, and Brian Wilson who were doing melodic bass lines at the time, all from completely different angles, L.A., Detroit, and London, all picking up on what each other were doing. Wow, that's a... Wow, where did you get this? Where's the site? The Beatles uh, Bible Okay, BeatlesBible.com, and this is a quote from Many Years From Now by Barry Miles, apparently a direct quotation of Paul. Could, would you mind terribly repeating that? I, 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 what, what Paul said about the writing process, he took what, the high E string and B string? This was written around two little notes, a very slim phrase, a two-note progression that I had very high on the first two strings of the guitar, the E and the B strings. I had it high up on the high E position, and I just let the note on the B string descend a semitone at a time, and kept the top note the same. And against that, I was playing a descending chromatic scale. Hmm. 
So. Hmm. I, I'm not quite getting. Yeah, what, I don't. I don't quite that. understand what how that works either. <laughs> yeah, it seems to me like. See, that's the sound when you when you start on the high E note, but then, then you'd make the A note on the B string, the pedal point. I don't quite get it, but I, I do roughly have an idea of what he's trying to get across. Um, if he had known music theory really well, he would be able to describe it better, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but if he knew music theory very well, he's convinced that he wouldn't have been able to write the stuff that he did. He you says he doesn't want to learn it because it would throw him off. Yeah, I had this uh, real character of a student some years ago. He was a singer-songwriter, came to me for lessons, shows up my door one day drunk. <laughs> I mean, he's drunk. <laughs> And I'm like, dude, do you want a guitar lesson while you're drunk? He goes, yeah, man. And then he starts to open up. He goes, you know, Vinny, all this music theory you're teaching me, he goes, is it going to take my innocence away? And you know what? There is a certain amount of truth to that. Like, for example, um, you've seen me lecture on the chord family template of a key. Well, I've trained my ear to such an extent like pop music. I'm a pop music guy. I've always been. And I've trained my ear to hear, like, the movement, say, from one to four, the one-four chord, or, or the five to six, or the two to five, or the three to five, like this. That was a resolution in early Beatles that was used a lot, from here to there. Um, so I trained my ear to be able to hear this, and the problem with that is, whenever I try to write a simple chord progression, I go, uh been done, been done, been done, been done. I've heard it, I've heard it, I've heard it. So I'm not interested in anything I write. <laughs> yeah, well, that being what it is, I mean, look, Paul McCartney can get away with not studying the theory because he's Paul oh, McCartney. Oh, absolutely. But I think most yeah. people would benefit from knowing what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. To me, I mean, yeah, especially for... Uh, the people that haven't, you know, haven't trained their ear to do that, uh, basically what it does is it simplifies. Instead of hunting and pecking for chords, you you know that you got a set of chords that will work together no matter what, you know. A very, when I kind of lay out this template for my students, I tell them, okay, now arbitrarily pick three chords. I don't care what three, you know. And, of course, those three chords will sound together. Why? They arise from the same scale. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So the um, the ooh la la la. So they they found that pedal point. Uh, I, actually, it sounds like McCartney found it right off the bat, uh, the way he wrote it. Um, so that's the way the harmony is working in the background. And it's not just that; it's coming out of the bridge into the verse with the. Uh, no, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. Ooh la la la, ooh la la la. And just oh, the yeah. way that lines up, I don't know. Something about that. It's just so. Yeah, bad. when Lennon repeats the line, I, I love it. You know, he, McCarthy goes, "No, I wouldn't." And uh, the uh, the I guess it's the harmony underneath. But yeah. I love it. I just love that moment. Yeah. And let's add the other layer to this. Ringo doing his one of a kind. Who could do that? Those kind of weird. Per really propulsive little fills that are so unique to Ringo. Yeah. That, they, they, uh, Ringo, yeah. yeah. It's just beautiful. Yeah, he has... Uh, Ringo is is a, one of the truly distinct drummers. Like, you can really tell it's him. I mean, to be honest, I've gotten so much shit for this on, on my YouTube channel. In one of my lectures, I, I was talking about the song I Want You, and I said, well, Ringo did his best to fake a Latin beat, but he didn't really know what Latin rhythm was. And man, did I get hell for that from some dude? He just ripped into me. Uh, but I'll, I'm standing by what I'm saying because I'm from New York, and that's where all the great Puerto Rican and Haitian drummers come from. And I've heard real Latin music. And I'm sorry, you need to be trained to do that. You just can't like imitate it and say, I'm doing Latin music. There's a whole art form to it. So I, I stick by that. But Ringo, one, Ringo, I... I think of as what I call an orchestral drummer. He plays with color. He doesn't just play beats, he plays colors. 
And uh, another drummer from the 80s who I felt was the best drummer of the 80s in rock was Stuart Copeland from The Police. He was another orchestral drummer. And he had rhythm out the wazoo, like yeah. pocket, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. I've only recently really gotten into Stuart Copeland, but yeah, no doubt about it. He's yeah, on another level. Yeah, I tell you the truth, the police were close. I was getting as closely reverent to the police as I was the Beatles. Not quite, but, um, you know, here's another British band that comes out with something completely new and different, basing it on black music again, just the way the Beatles did, you know, in this case, reggae, you know? Where the Beatles were listening to Motown and and uh, and blues and stuff like this, you know. Exactly right. Like James Jamerson, the Motown feel. Interesting. Yep. yep. Are you, anything else to say about you won't see me before we wrap it up? Let me just kind of roll through the song for a sec. That's the beginning of the song, right? this is the line we have our second line then the other line comes back please turn around and then we go to the bridge high line further down and then nothing else to say I mean it the song literally speaks for itself as I'm just I, I'm literally floored by this one song literally floored because McCartney does it once and never does it again yep and any other I mean any other songwriter that came up with that would have been mining it until you know there was nothing left but exactly you know i've heard mccartney i've heard mccartney take a particular turn uh, like a chord phrase and do it more than once like twice instead of just once i've seen him do that um uh you know it's funny i, I got i had a student the other day wanted to learn the 70s it's actually a pretty song it's kind of kind of sappy but it's really cool um um, it was a Boz Skag song, but the first chords are G. And I, taught, I turned to my student and I said, that is a beautiful move, that chord movement. And where he got it from was Yesterday by the Beatles. Yeah, I was just going to say, that's Yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, so um, that's a beautiful move. It's very interesting. It, it falls into something I call the category of secondary dominance, and this is a two five one to E minor. Um, and it's just it's just a lovely sound. I think he used it again in um, in. Uh, <laughs> that song from an analysis point of view is also amazing uh james there is something i'm really excited about that i discovered years ago um not years ago actually recently i should say in the course of writing my book there's something that happened that came out of the blues okay where you'd get what i call wandering major chords and you might have seen me mention these in some of my earlier videos where you get like chord movements like That sort of thing. Well, a key has three major chords, so I did six chords there. What is going on? And I discovered something. It, it emerges from the blues, the fact that you pit minor against a major key, and I call it key blending. And 
the result of this key blend thing, it flowers into something that no longer sounds like the blues anymore, but it's this very lovely um, chord movement. Um, which I, I'm going to get to way down in the future in my videos, but uh, a lot of the um, the sound when you hear Billy Shears and Peppers, that is what I call the, the um, parallel relative switch, just that movement. But there's so much more. When you combine two keys together like this and combine the minor chords, you get this lovely stuff. Um, and uh, there, there, quite a bit of this is going on in Abbey Road, where you get these chord movements based on this sort of idea. Didn't I Am the Walrus start with a big, long, wandering major? Oh, he, the genius of I Am the Walrus is this. This is Lennon. He gets an idea, and it's not really theoretically viable, but he does it. It's so creative that, you know, when you compare Lennon and McCartney, they're two very different writers. You know, their tastes and... But their competition with each other brought out so much. All right, if you take the C scale, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right, the, the, the basic letters, the musical alphabet, and you turn every one of those into a major chord, that's basically what's going on with, uh, with I Am the Walrus. You know, you have B, A, G, F. And what he does is, like, he, that's, that's like the intro. What he does with this song is, that's, we, we ought to reserve another time to do I Am The Walrus, because, oh my God, <laughs> it's like, dude. <laughs> we really should. In fact, let's leave that as the segue into telling people about your channel and about the work you do and about how they can find you and uh, see some of the other stuff you've done. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so... Uh, First of all, I do have a website. I think websites are becoming kind of uh, obsolete at this point. You, you know, you're either on Facebook or YouTube. But I have a website, vincognito.com, uh, where I have some, uh, you can uh, check out some samples of uh, my CD from the early uh, 2000s, which is uh, looping a guitar, live looping, not, not premeditated. And um, it's very psychedelic and textural stuff, very different than what I'm doing today, which is I'm exploring a lot of gypsy jazz and Western swing. Um, on my channel, uh, of course, you'll find a bunch of performances of many bands I've been in, the Elegant uh, Strangers, which is my local band, for fun and kicks. I have the Blue Kind, which should be checked out. We're a hair-raisingly great band uh, with a whole horn section and lots of blues element and jazz element in that group. Um, uh I had a band called the Venice Roasters. That was the coolest band by far ever in the universe. I love this band so much. Where we took a uh, classic rock song and set it to like a gypsy jazz beat. So uh, a song like, uh, I'm not particularly fond of Hotel California, but when we did it, I loved it. Uh, and we do it like... Uh it was a hoot. So there's some Venice Roasters videos up there. Uh, bad quality, but the sound's there. And then, of course, I have my analysis. Uh, so I have a whole section on um, different Beatle analysis by album and by song. Um, so there's playlists for that. There's a playlist for... I do have a music theory for guitar playlist, but it was kind of scattered. I just kind of did random stuff for that guy that would interview me. So I plan on doing more along the lines of my book. And that's the other playlist, my book, Fragments of Infinity, which is basically what I call it, um, what they never taught you in music school, and it's true. And they didn't teach you this stuff in music school. And I've made a number of discoveries about music, uh, including the parallel relative switch. And a lot of my analysis is basically songs from the 60s, the great songwriters of the 60s, including people like um, um, Carly, si not Carly Simon, um, uh, Carol King, um, of course the Beatles, uh, uh, the Simon and Garfunkel, the Mamas and the Papas had a couple of songs that were Beatles level greatness. They had a few songs, including Monday Monday. The chord movement in that is just over the top. Uh, Jim Webb, uh, one of the great in industry composers. Uh, one day I'm going to tear apart the song. It's such a dorky song, Up, Up and Away in My Beautiful Balloon. But man, I know that's when Jim must have taken his first acid trip because the modulations in that are just, oh, 
dude. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. It's all over the map, and it's cohesive. And that's the beauty. So anyway, my book, Fragments of Infinity, right now I'm in the basic levels, just broaching the Greek modes. I've come up with a number of discoveries, and uh, one major discovery, very, very important discovery, is the fact that there is not one system of music theory. There are three, and we're looking through the other two systems through the lens of the wrong system, and there's all this wrong crosstalk about the way things are. And you could take, a, I'm sure I could take a variety, a great cross-section of Beatles songs and show you this, this is this system working here, this is this system working there, and that's that system working over there. So I look into that. Right now we're approaching the Greek modes and going to go very deep. In the future. And I'm along for the ride. I've been watching every single episode of that. Uh, definitely recommend people Very check cool. it out. Fragments of Infinity. We'll, of course, put the links to all this up in the show notes. Um, Vinny, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. And I'm going to say we're going to put this out for the subscribers of Corbett Report. The raw, here it is, 40-plus minute <laughs> analysis of one Beatles song. But um, I do insist that you do make a uh, record one on your end and make it high quality and condense it down for the world to see because I think the world deserves this kind of analysis of uh, great music. So, mm -hmm. Will do. I mean, I got to check the channel just to see if I did this song before because I, I did used to do it a lot like with different students, but I don't know if we ever actually videoed it. So, Well, yeah. either way. Excellent. We'll direct people there. Vinny Caggiano, Vincognito up on YouTube. Thank you so much for your time. Great pleasure.